Avant de commencer cette vidéo, likez et partagez cette vidéo et envoyez-y des commentaires. Ça ne vous coûte rien. Euh, Faites-vous plaisir, lâchez les Merci. Et profitez bien de la vidéo.
Detroit Become Human was uh, produced over a period of four years. Here in Paris, we have a team of about 180 people. And to that, we need to add also all the outsourcing with our partners in the Philippines, in China, Vietnam, and in India. So when we started working on this story, I had to um, imagine where Cara was built. And um, for whatever reason, the city of Detroit came very quickly to my mind because it had already an incredible story by itself of, uh, of history and themes. So we traveled there with the team and we were really moved by what we saw and we could really um, feel the desire to fight and, and really uh, be born again. And we just continued this curve, this growth, and just imagine what Detroit would be like if the Android industry was, um, you know, using these huge factories to build Androids there. A very strong element in Detroit is that there's a lot of industrial wasteland and a lot of nature too. And for us, the graphic designers, it was an incredible playground. The destroyed zones which we wanted to preserve, we appropriated them to turn into something else. Then in the areas that needed to be rebuilt, we were able to imagine our Detroit of the future. We didn't want to make a science fiction universe, but a world of anticipation. If we chose science fiction, we could have imagined flying cars, extraterrestrials, but those things are very far from our current everyday life. Anticipation is more about gleaning from our contemporary reality, the one we know, because Detroit is set in 2038, and 2038 is tomorrow. The difficulty we had was sticking to reality. That is to say, technology becoming more and more invisible, a lot more elegant, and at the same time, making it visual. So all the computer equipment, autonomous cars, we simply had to invent. They are in fact very technological objects, but at the same time remain very credible and ingrained in reality. To create a cohesive universe in the fashion and clothing of the human characters in 2038, I didn't want to put an accent on strange shapes or really vibrant colors and things we wouldn't know. That I wanted to keep for the androids. The goal was to create something familiar which we can identify with in this future setting. Working on the artistic direction for the androids was a bit special because this is a project about the place they could occupy in the human world. It was out of the question for them to be too beautiful or too perfect. They had to correspond to every social class, rich and poor. Inspired by everyday utilitarian clothes, I brought a modern touch by adding dynamic display surfaces, the armband we can see on the side, the triangle on the front and back, and LED. Like that, there's no confusion. Wait. You're just an android? All right, ma'am. You need to go. You can't do that. You, why aren't you sending a real person? Once we cast the actors, we travel to meet them in order to scan their faces. We record the structure of their face with the scan and we record the colors and patches of skin with photography. Once we have this information, we will use this as a basis for modeling and creating the characters. The artist will make it more realistic, but will also enrich it. He will propose ideas which we will develop together. Finally, we will have a character with character who corresponds to the project in the world. When the actors come to Quantic Dream, we show them the design, what their image will be, and what they will look like in the game. This extra information gives them another dimension and color to connect with emotionally. It helps them think about how to play their character. Your mission. That's all you care about, huh? You should consult a professional who can help you. Beat it, you hear me? Get the hell out of here. So there are three types of shoots at Quantic Dream. Shooting and performance capture, where you capture the whole actor, his voice, his face, and his body. These shoots are obviously done with American actors because the game's original version is in American English. After that, there are the body-only shoots, representing around 250 days of filming, while the performance capture is 100 days of filming. Now, body-only shoots, there are two types. There are the action shoots and the technical shoots, which are mokit shoots. Mokit is when the player controls a character on the screen and he moves in an environment to explore it. This is of particular importance at Quantic Dream, and therefore we shoot a lot to offer a unique context for each scene and each character. To prepare a motion capture shoot, we first get together to look at the sets we need, the animations that we want to shoot, 
which ones need to be grouped together or which ones need to be cut and shot at another time so that we get the most out of the shooting day. This often means shooting scenes out of order, especially those with big props or accessories like a big car, for example. So we shoot all the animations related to that particular prop first. The biggest challenge for the mocap team was shooting a Spider-Man mo-kit. We had to build a wall and attach an actor to a harness with cables so we could pull him up and render him climbing. The shooting on this game total took about, I would say, more than a year, maybe one and two years, with about 300 actors on, on set. So I would say it's quite a massive production. But so much happened on this set between the stunts and the shootings with a little girl and, and all the, these great actors that we had. It was really a, a very, very memorable journey for the team and for myself. Today, Detroit has over 37,000 animations. When we retrieve the motion capture data, it's just a cloud of points, which represent all the markers worn by the actors. From this cloud of points, we have a phase called retargeting, which gives us a skeleton. This skeleton will be applied to the characters of the game. There is still work to be done, but this gives us the main movements. Since we are working on something very realistic, we must recognize the actor and also recover all the emotion he expresses in his performance. We use a system of facts, an identity card for each actor. We make the actor do a whole range of facial expressions. Then we recover all the expressions and paste the animations on a puppet that Jan has prepared. I then recover and refine these poses. I might stretch the lip, reinflate a cheek, tiny details that make the finished product really capture the actor. Because of the nature of our mocap system today, when we receive the animations, we're missing eye movements. And so the character has that dead look. He really has no eyes, so then it's a big part of the work for the animators to find the regard of the actor in relation to his position, in relation to the body, etc. It was crazy when I saw the newest model for Kara, because they've been working on it and working on it, and this was the first time I literally jumped in my seat. It not only looked so much like me, it was the fact that it looked so lifelike. It wasn't that it looked just like it was a camera, it was something else, you know, but it looked alive. It's exciting, and it's kind of terrifying. <laughs> game after game, we learned the rules of, of optics and, and filming. And uh, our goal with Detroit Become Human was to have cameras that would actually emulate the optics of a real physical camera. So basically dealing with uh, real world imperfections was our main task and uh, just to make cameras look as real as we can. Once the animations are shot and processed by the animation department, integrated and polished. We film them. That is to say, we really do a mise-en-scene, as in cinema. The real difficulty of our job is to know if these cameras are telling us something. Are they in the emotion of the scene? Do they describe exactly what the action must convey, what must be felt? The most important challenge for me was one of the final scenes where Marcus decides to start the revolution and go to the battlefield. Very quickly, we imagine this to be a huge sequence shot. We wanted the feeling of a cameraman running behind us while showing Marcus, the androids who help him, the person shooting at us, etc. Above all, it was necessary to say to oneself, this scene is very violent but does not glorify war. On the contrary, that war is something improbable and absurd. It was really a fun challenge. The idea was to say we have three characters who would like each of them to have a specific cinematography. We wanted Kara to be much more film with some kind of handheld camera to have something very uh, living, very breathing. For Connor, we wanted something very cold and very perfect. And for Marcus, we wanted something epic and spectacular. So it was about the, the filming, but it was also about the photography. So we worked with the, with the director of photography to give each character a different lighting, different key colors. Each of them would have their own worlds 
And finally, we worked with the composers, so they would create a specific sound for each character, so each would have his own world and his own style. For the soundtrack of the game, we tried to be very close to what is done in film. We were constantly asking at each place in the game, why are we putting music here? What is it going to say? So we focused the music on bringing emotion, which is interactive and supports the character's art. I'm sorry, honey. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know I love you, don't you? You know I love you. We make games that are very narrative. We're really into interactive drama, so the soundtrack also had to go in that direction, supporting the three characters' very different stories. We really wanted three colors, three musical sound identities, and from there, having three composers made sense, since the story of Kara, Marcus, and Connor are all completely different. You recognize him? It's Carlos Ortiz. For Connor, we wanted a soundtrack that could be very cold and very um, mechanical, very machine-esque somehow. For Kara, we wanted a soundtrack that would be very moving and emotional. It was about the quest for identity, but it was also a journey about love and empathy. And for Marcus, we wanted something epic, some, something that would really represent the grand aspect of his quest. And we were very fortunate to find three incredibly talented composers and uh, working with them has been a dream, honestly. My name is Philip Shepard and I'm a composer and a cellist and a producer and today we're at Abbey Road Studio One, which is my favourite studio in the world and today we're recording the soundtrack for Cara from Become Human. So when I compose a big project, I often travel just to kind of get out you know, and, and get some fresh air and some inspiration. And I go um, hiking and traveling in Montana a lot. I had a, a log fire in the room that I was staying in and the flames were kind of making absolutely direct music. And it became the basis for Cara's theme and it sounds something like this. Now, over the top of that, I found a little theme that just seemed to fit over the top, which is taking Cara's name, Cara, Cara, and just using like a two-syllable motif, and it sounds like this. fitting over. So it kind of works in lots of levels. And in fact, every single theme in the score has one of those elements built into it. And it becomes sort of the DNA of every single tune. For me, writing this theme for Kara, I actually had to tap in to what it feels like to be a father to daughters. I really had to tap into everything I feel about my daughters. I'm thinking, well, if I had to write music for them and that sense of trying to protect them but also give them the freedom, that's totally where it came from. Because each composer has been given the sort of narrative responsibility for very different characters, I haven't had to sort of go into other styles. I can actually be very loyal to this particular character and sort of hopefully encapsulate her. But it means also I've suddenly become very connected to this character. And if for some reason it goes to game over early, I'm going to be mortified. <laughs> you know? They're over there. 
Starting a new project for me personally, it's always finding the right tone, finding the right color, I like to call it. For me, it's finding that right texture that actually sits against picture really well. One of the biggest thing is I created custom instruments for Connor. I pulled out all my vintage synthesizers um, to be able to capture this robotic person, if you will. My approach to uh, all of these custom instruments is that I hear the sound in my head. Um, and either I could just come into the piano and just be like, all right, so I'm gonna just get on the computer and just create it. i rather be able to play these instruments physically. As soon as you see Connor the first time, there is a really interesting um, thematic idea that you hear, and it's that's just made out of a Moog synthesizer, but completely manipulated in multiple ways. And it's it's robotic. It has a little bit of an emotional to it. it he's he's on his mission, so you feel that as well. So it just kind of gives you that cold, motionless, with a mission in hand that you kind of feel throughout the whole thing. Because the music evolved, one of the things that I was very weary and I was very kind of uh, focused on was the way that the music has to evolve. So my idea behind it was that Connor is a singular android that could at any point become a deviant or could actually stay as an android. So I created a more or less a uh, Connor theme and then I was able to just manipulate it in different aspects of it. Is everything okay, Lieutenant? Chris was on patrol last night. He was attacked by a bunch of deviants. I'm a human being writing for a robot. And throughout uh, Connor's journey, he meets someone, he meets a partner. So how do you deal with a robot feeling? And I've met a partner that I'm gonna work with, uh, or all of a sudden he sees a dead body. Does this robot have an imagination? Does this robot have a feeling? And if yes, how do you translate that into non-emotional music? Uh, so it basically at any point I was just like, I can't do this, I can't do this, and then I just do it. <laughs> property was damaged and fires continued to rage in several major districts. Some people are asking, have androids become a threat to our security? When I first started really digging in on Marcus, um, the one thing that I really try to capture was the transformation process. You know, Marcus is this android that evolves over the course of the game and, and really goes from kind of figuring out that he's more than just an android. You know, he's starting to develop kind of a human soul in a, in a way. Try to imagine something that doesn't exist, something you've never seen. Now concentrate on how it makes you feel and let your hand drift across the canvas. On the other side of Marcus that I really latched onto was that he almost became a savior for a lot of the other androids in the game. So when I started developing the theme for Marcus, I really made it like a church hymn. I wanted it to be very simple. I wanted to make it a chordal melody. I really wanted to make it almost like a Bach hymn. The tough thing with that is it had to be recognizable. If I made it too complex from a harmonic standpoint, it would be hard, I think, for people to kind of pick it out and recognize it. It's very acoustic derived, but it's, it's also been treated with a lot of effects and things to kind of put it into the space that I, I, I felt the sound should be in. It can be beautiful, it can be haunting, it can be extremely powerful um, from an action standpoint, um, and I'm really happy with the way it turned out. The music is um, is there, but it's subliminal and it's emotional and people are, are, are feeling it and it's not distracting. And that's tricky with a game like this, where you have to have a lot of ins and outs like that, where, where the music kind of has to get in and out of these moments. This is a war we're fighting with the humans. If we fail, they'll destroy us. I think the game's been put together so well, where I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't ruining the emotion. Yeah, 
I gotta be honest, when we first started on this path, I said, oh man, this could be pretty messy, you know? I mean, it could feel disconnected and, but I mean, it's amazing how they really guided us and got us to really kind of all be in the same world, but at the same time feeling completely different. So it's really gonna stand out and kind of be one of those games where um, people are really gonna notice the music and kind of how it was crafted and, you know, and all the hard work that went into making, being able to pull it off in a graceful way. For starters, what should I call you? I'm Chloe. And you, what's your name? Oh, uh, John. My name is John. Delighted to meet you, John. Could you tell us a little about yourself and what you can do, Chloe? Of course. I'm the first personal assistant built by CyberLife. I take care of most everyday tasks like cooking, housework, or managing your appointments, for example. Mm. And I understand you're the first android to have passed the Turing test. Could you tell us a little more about that? I really didn't do much, you know. I just spoke with a few humans to see if they could tell the difference between me and a real person. It was a really interesting experience. But this is the first time in history that man has created a machine more intelligent than himself. I gather your brain can perform several billion billion operations per second, is that right? Absolutely, but I only exist thanks to the intelligence of the humans who designed me. And, you know, they have something I could never have. Really? And what's that? A soul. Hold on just a little while longer. Hold on just a little while longer. Hold on just a little while longer. Everything. Will be all right. Everything will be all right. Fight on just a little while longer. Fight on just a little while longer. Fight on just a little while longer. Everything will be all right. Everything will be all right. We will sing on just a little while.
Rock-a-bye, baby, in the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. And down will come, baby, cradle and all. Rock a bye, baby, in the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. And down will come, baby, cradle Rock-a-bye, baby, in the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. And down will come, baby, cradle and all. In the space of a few years, androids have completely transformed the world in which we live. By letting androids into our homes and factories, the CyberLife company has made them everyday technology. The founder of CyberLife, Elijah Kamsky, is a very discreet man, despite being the CEO of the highest valued company in the world and being voted man of the year by Century Magazine, he remains a mystery for most people. That's why we at KNC are so excited to be here as CyberLife opens its doors for the first time. Elijah Kamsky, could you please tell us where we are? Certainly, and welcome. We're currently in CyberLife's production center in Detroit, where all models are designed and manufactured. More than 10,000 androids come off the production line every day. Fascinating. Could you tell us what your goal was when you founded CyberLife? Hmm. Well, I simply wanted to use technology to carry out all of our most annoying and repetitive tasks so we'd have more time to enjoy life. I imagine you must have faced many challenges. Yes, there were technical challenges, but the hardest thing was to design an object that we would want to welcome into our homes. We had to imagine a machine in our own image that resembles us in every way, that moves, breathes, blinks like us, but yet is smarter and more capable than any human being. Let me show you around. We're here in production unit four. Could you explain in a few words how the androids are made? Sure, yeah, it's very simple. We use machines to manufacture machines. The removable parts are assembled on a production line, and then we apply a synthetic skin to the whole body. A human operator checks the cognitive abilities with a pre-established protocol, and finally, the android is conditioned and sent out throughout the country. Here's your result. Say something. Hello. I am a RZ400 model. How can I be of service? You can go now. Our androids are already replacing humans in many fields. For example, they represent more than 80% of all university professors and 63% of all medical staff. Tomorrow they'll replace our soldiers. And who knows, maybe one day, our leaders to make the best decisions in humanity's interest. Come on. Replacing humans with machines has led to record unemployment of hmm. 28%. What do you think about the situation? Uh, <laughs> okay. The first steam engines also caused an increase in unemployment. But no one today would imagine turning back the clock. Artificial intelligence 
makes everyday lives easier. Nothing can stop progress. What's happening here is inevitable. These days, more and more people choose to live with an android rather than another human being. Does this development worry you? <laughs> Everything's much easier with an android. They obey your orders without ever complaining. They can cook, discuss philosophy with you, have intimate relationships according to your desires. They never say no. Obviously, they are the perfect partner. Everyone deserves happiness. Why deprive yourself of so-called moral reasons when a machine can make you happy? Many science fiction books tell the story of how machines become more intelligent than us and end up confronting us. Aren't you worried about that possibility? I understand the irrational fears about artificial intelligence, but I assure you, that will never happen with a CyberLife android. They're designed to obey humans. They're machines. They can't ever develop uh, any sort of desires or, or form of consciousness. Are you sure? I'm absolutely certain. You can trust me. Salut à tous, voilà, j'ai fini avec les trois. Euh, j'ai fait une autre, une autre mission de, des trois Bitcoin Human, mais euh, vous verrez ça prochainement. Là, on se concentre sur la dernière part de l'histoire euh, du jeu, euh, les, les, les suppléments de, de D3. Voilà, la fin, la, les suppléments de D3, c'est vraiment la fin. Hein. Vraiment, c'est. Alors. Après avoir le, lu le script détaillé envoyé par David Cage, le créateur du, du jeu, plusieurs questions relevées sans casse. Qui est Connor Que représente-t-il Et qui est un véritable Android Ces questions existentielles m'ont servi de base pour créer le morceau Connor Suite. Il représente le voyage émotionnel, la mission, les doutes, la précise de conscience et des déceptions de Connor. J'ai capturé le son de Connor grâce à de nombreux synthétiseurs vintage. Ouais, les synthétiseurs, les synthétiseurs analogiques et modulaires, rares mais aussi avec des manières non traditionnelles de jouer des instruments d'orchestre. Le premier son qui est attendu vient de Tiens, d'un synthétiseur, là il échec ce mot. Mog Vintage. Crée des mélodies, mélodies de grave puissance qui représentent la froideur, la curiosité et de la dé dé détermination du connard par la suite. On peut entendre en tas d'instruments électriques en acoustique. Acoustique, une guitare électrique, une basse électrique, une orchestre à ondes électriques. Mina Farahara. Donc si vous connaissez pas le truc, bah vous le verrez dans le dans les dans le, ce qu'on vient de passer, voilà les vidéos. Ce qu'on vient de passer. Voilà. Euh, j'ai d'autres trucs à lire. Oui j'ai d'autres trucs à lire. Putain il y a tout ça à lire. Boldel. J'espère que c'est pas des, des, des grandes phrases quand même. 
Bon, allons. C'est d'aujourd'hui, palpitant de travail sur la bande. Annonce d'un projet sur lequel on est impliqué. C'est une opportunité rare. Je vous l'aimerais que le thème de Marcus soit présent dans la bande annonce pour le 3. Car c'était la toute première fois que je future les joueurs. <rire> les futurs les, les futurs. Euh joueurs de reconnaître c'est une plateforme parfaite pour nous quelqu'un lequel marcus c'est le, le jeu à travers marcus ok Il devra faire face le but de morceau était ainsi qui cette lutte tout en façon de mettre l'intérêt pour l'avenir d'un certain de marcus je je sais pas c'est le truc euh de Marcus. Ok. Bon, j'ai le son qui m'en casse. Ça veut dire que j'entends pas le. Ouais, j'entends pas le musique. Ça, je vais mettre le truc. C'est pas mal quand même le son. Euh, encore Marcus. Les jeux comme Detroit Bacon Human sont vraiment une grande source d'inspiration à cause de leur lien étroit avec le cinéma. J'ai composé la bande originale du jeu comme s'il s'agissait d'un film Wall Pearl et un morceau qui a pour but de créer une expérience cin cinématographique pour les joueurs. Euh, les joueurs. Donc, euh, ouais, bon, j'ai du mal à traduire le truc, mais. Euh, Paul, euh, Paul Marceau, donc c'est... Euh, bon, la steak, le thème du préjugé et la l'esclavage sont impliqués et obscurs. Mais la présence, représence de l'espoir, de l'anti-liberté est tellement ancrée dans les actions de Marcus qu'il fallait à, à l'avoir à la fois donné de légères aspects sombres en morceaux. Je ne pas ça. Ok. Ouais, vraiment pas mal la musique. <rire> ouais, j'en ai mon casque pour euh, entendre le truc, mais j'ai pas mis le truc là cette fois. Je l'ai mis dans mon casque. Donc, il faudra que je le retire d'ailleurs. 300 dollars, enfin 300 points de, de D3, on y va. Cara. Ouais, ça c'est le truc de Cara. Une grande partie de, des aventures de Cara se déroulent en. En extérieur et la plupart des et le va et vient du shot d'orchestre donne l'impression que la musique inspire et expire en passant d'une corde à l'autre et parmi toutes ces couches couchées le, les, les thèmes de carré allié s'entrecroisent dans les mélodies cachées Philip Shepard ok mon téléphone qui est allez on y va <rire> il n'en reste plus beaucoup là ouais. <rire> j'attends la suite 300. Oh my god. Ce morceau est écrit pour une scène de produit. produit où tout peut se terminer de manière violente et brutale. En tant que producteur, mon travail est de décrire l'action autant que possible, tout en laissant le joueur réagir à sa fa façon. Avec... Je sais pas, j'ai du mal à entendre le afin de ressentir les émotions comme la peur ou l'extase avec alors imaginez tout ce qui peut tout ce qu'il faut et décrire que ce soit l'environnement le mouvement des personnages leur leur état mental et Marvin donc on est encore avec ouais on est encore avec avec Shepard. Alors, Marvin Minsky est l'un des personnages les plus intelligents que j'ai jamais rencontré. Il a été emprisonné dans le domaine de l'intelligence artificielle et son magnifique cerveau pourrait en plus en accueillir. En, en train de, et en profondeur son sens de l'humour marin. Marvin était également un brillant musicien, sa femme. Lauréat et sa fille Margaret 
m'ont donné l'incroyable opportunité de travailler, travailler, travailler avec les enregistrements de ces improvisations et des et composition au piano. Wow. J'ai les yeux qui flanchent là. <rire> bon allez, on y va. Euh... <rire> Après son décès, j'ai eu l'idée d'enregistrer l'un des mais un des magnifiques morceaux de mon ami avec orchestre complet et compagnie à Bayreuil. Je sais que Martin aurait adoré ce jeu, ses réflexions profondes sur l'intelligence artificielle, ses histoires multiples. Et, et son âme, c'est pour cela que nous avons caché sa manière. Mise dans le jeu, voici une citation de Martin. Martin, Martin bon, vous voulez, euh, pour, créer, pour créer des machines qui font des films à partir des scripts, il nous faut développer de nouvelles théories sur le fonctionnement de notre esprit. Si on travaille avec les médias, c'est à dire avec l'intention de changer ce qui ce que les, les autres pensent il faut se baser sur la théorie des deux plusieurs autres domaines la pensée et le raisonnement la mémoire et les émotions de la nature même de la communication Philippe Schaeffer ouais vraiment c'est je sais que c'est un peu pitot que comme je lis comme ça mais il y a quand même pas mal de quand même du monde quand même qui me dit je pas envie de dire je pas j'ai pas envie de le dire quoi, mais... je le dirai pas mais je sais que c'est catastrophique quand je lis désolé quand je lis 8 comme ça c'est ouh il y a des, des, des mots qui se barrent Pouf allez on continue <rire> on continue je dépense mes points pour lire quoi je dépense mais on, on, ça coûte pas très cher quoi. Alors, 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 quand l'ebra. Depuis 2012, Shepard et Dandersa ont sorti deux al albums complétés de musique. Charmeur. 2015, avril 2017, Mick Morrison de chez Americana, Ross Wick. Sorti que deux albums, mais pour moi les Whisky Charm sont l'un des mes groupes préférés depuis le 21e siècle. Les, les fans décrivent souvent la musique de Whisky Charm comme une, le sentiment qui m'a traversé le désert. Un désert des décapotables, celui que se retrouver dans un bar, celui perdu au milieu de nulle part. Ou encore comme la musique, la western spaghetti. <coughs> On les compare souvent aux cowboys, Junky et Marc contre à la Loretta Lynn. La musique pourrait casser dans le, dans le, dans le genre américain. Un jeu créé par le légende du terre Dal Dal Watson Watts William David ancien sous-directeur de Grandpay Music Hall pas du même avis j'ai écouté un tas de commissions mais il n'y a pas sans doute à personne de pour moi c'est un des meilleurs compétences dans ce milieu ok <rire> ok wow. Wow, wow, wow je connais pas tous ces trucs hein. ces chanteurs c'est cette chose c'est musicien c'est incroyable ok on continue Ouh. ah oui, il est 50 bon c'est la grave euh, je vous laisse lire hein. c'est gratuit hein. en chant la magor je crois qu'elle en a pris un coup j'ai plus de salut elle est pas mal la photo j'avoue il comme... y a un fantôme dans ma chambre il ouais, y a un fantôme la, la porte s'ouvre toute seule allez on y va <rire> on y va
Oups, j'ai fait n'importe quoi. La 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 la. Voilà. Désolé. Emily Rose est une chanteuse composée exprimée basée à Détroit. Dans le Michigan, son travail est souvent qualifié d'intelligence imperturbable, sincère et belly béry. Rose prévoit de sortir son cinquième album, sorti en 2012, euh, 2018, pardon. N'importe quoi. Et on continue sur notre lancé, hein, on va finir. L'un des pères fondateurs de musique électronique. Il est né à grandir à Détroit, Michigan, aux États-Unis, a obtenu son diplôme au lycée Bellevue en 1980. Je crois que c'est la fin de cette vidéo. Euh, je crois qu'on a tout découvert sur des trois. Hein. Euh, si je me trompe pas, et bon, les personnages, les galères et tout ça, on verra ça plus tard. Euh, moi, je vous laisse sur cette musique de, de fin. Euh, voilà. C'est tout pour ce moment. Je vous dis à tout à l'heure. Ciao, ciao. Demain, il y aura un film vers 21h. Ne ratez pas le film. Je, je vous dirai ça. Euh, verrons demain. On verra. Demain après-midi, peut-être que je ferai une vidéo dire. Il y aura une, un film qui sortira. Voilà. On sait pas. Mais les trois semaines sont passées, donc c'est bon, il y aura un film, c'est sûr. 21h. Puis c'est les vacances. Voilà. Se passer. En cas.
Salut les amis et très chers abonnés aussi. Euh, J'espère que vous allez bien. Pour de ma part, moi ça va très bien. Euh, pour vous dire, donc là on va pas parler de vue MyQuay 5, on va parler de, surtout de ma chaîne YouTube. Je sais que ça fait de nombreuses années que je voulais en parler de. Des. Ouais, des, de nombreuses années que j'ai envie de parler. Et du coup, on va en parler là dès maintenant. Donc, premier truc, euh, je vais juste vous dire tout simplement, parce que là, je suis complètement fatigué, j'étais déjà à Paris, il y a 5 heures, bah, voilà, c'est un peu... Euh... Donc, je ne peux pas trop faire de, de montage euh, vidéo, un petit peu, un tout petit peu, mais euh, je ne vais pas me plaindre à ce point-là quand même. J'ai bu de nombreux cafés aussi, il n'y a pas de problème, mais, euh, mais quand même, je suis assez fatigué. Alors, pour vous dire, euh, cette semaine, donc il y aura 4, euh, 4 vidéos par semaine là. Enfin, 4 vidéos cette semaine là. Pardon. Excusez-moi. C'est ma fatigue qui a pris le dessus. Euh, donc là, il y a 4, 4 vidéos cette semaine là. Mais il y en aura 5. Ne vous inquiétez pas, il y en aura 5. Alors, c'est pas ce que je suis en manque d'imagination. Hein. Au contraire, j'ai beaucoup d'imagination. C'est juste que je voulais. Je veux améliorer un peu mon travail euh, de montage. Euh, voilà, je vais améliorer les trucs, quoi, tu vois. Vous voyez les, euh, le, le truc. Faire des. Faire des. Des petits. Des petites mises en scène, enfin tout. Euh, vous, vous verrez, vous verrez.